Welcome to the March 18th regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Please take a moment to silence your cell phone and then join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Hatfield, can you take roll for us, please? Absolutely. Uh, President Rausch. Here. Vice President McFarland. Here. Secretary Hatfield's here. Treasurer Lauterbach. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringgold. Here. Member Horwitz. Present. All accounted for. Item number two is the consent agenda. 2.1, our approval of the minutes from the February 20th, 2024 regular meeting the February 20th, 2024 special meeting, February 26th, 2024 special meeting, and the February 28th, 2024 special meeting. Item 2.2, the below staff are being recommended for hire as listed. One hire for the 23-24 school year, and then three hires for the 24-25 school year. And we'll hear from two of them in a minute. Um, item 2.3, the below staff have announced their resignation, effective as the dates listed in your agenda packet for five staff members. Item 2.4 is an employee leave of absence request. Item number five, our approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of January 2024, as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of $7,954,421 is recommended. The distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation. And then finally, item 2.6, approval is requested to authorize legal payments to the below list of professional legal fees through and law firm PC for $1,545, dated February 28, 2024. Accept the motion for approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Support. Support or motion by Lauterbach, support by McFarland. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor of approving the consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.6 say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries 7-0. So Turn it over to introduction of two new staff members. Yeah, we're really excited to welcome uh, Lucas and Troy to our team. And I think they both want to come up and say a few words and introduce themselves to the board. Lucas? Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Hey, good evening. So I'm Lucas Pellis. I am a former uh, Midland um, student. I came from Adams up to Northeast, up to Midland High. And I'm super excited to be chosen as the next um, coordinator for the PATHS program and the uh, accordant uh, other offerings there. And because of the growing need for that in our community. And having grown up in the community and now being able to give back to the community that helped raise me, um, I'm really excited to be joining the Midland Public Schools community. And I'd just like to come up and shake your hands if that's okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Troy Lynch. The last time I can tell you I was in front of a school board was when I tried to get John Glenn High School into the Saginaw Valley League. <laughs> and I see a lot more smiles up there now than what I had in my days then there. Um, again, I am just as excited as Lucas. You got a great hire with Lucas um, working with him. We're both excited to be part of Midland Public Schools. This is now my third year, coming into my third year in the district. And I'm um, going to be able to work with Melissa on her way out, so I'm excited for that as well. Looking forward to everything that, that this position will challenge me with, and I appreciate this opportunity. I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Congratulations. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> nice change. 
Congrats on the new role. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for being And I did tell them they didn't have to stay for the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Have a great night. Thank you. All right, next up, Penny with uh, Shining Stars. Dave makes me nervous when he gets the camera out. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, we have two tonight, and unfortunately our first one couldn't be with us, but I did tell her I was still going to read all the good things about her and that we will properly celebrate her uh, when I see her next. Our first shining star is Laura Lee Larson. Laura Lee joined our MPS team in 2018 when she was hired as an office professional in our payroll department, in our business office. From there, she transitioned to administrative assistant in payroll and to manager of payroll, which is the position she currently holds. And it's kind of a theme, she is a Midland Public Schools grad, uh, graduating from Dow High School. Laura Lee was nominated for her shining star by an MPS colleague, and among their comments were the following. Laura Lee has shown unwavering dedication and professionalism in her role as payroll manager. Her commitment to accuracy, we love that in payroll, uh, timeliness, for sure, and attention to detail has been nothing short of outstanding. With the complex and critical nature of payroll management in a school district, Laura Lee has not only met but exceeded our expectations in every way. She has remarkable customer service skills. She, is cons she consistently goes the extra mile to ensure that employee payroll related inquiries and concerns are addressed promptly and with the utmost care and consideration. Laura Lee embodies the spirit of a team player and demonstrates admirable work ethic. Her exemplary customer service and proactive contributions set a standard for her colleagues and she is an inspiration to us all. Congratulations to Laura Lee. Come on up here and stand by me. Our second shining star is uh, a teacher of ours, Anne Lang, and she is with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm going to say some really wonderful things about you. Thank you. And I'll just give you this to hold. Oh, I love in gifts. Advance. I know. <laughs> I know. Anne joined the MPS team in 2010 as a second grade teacher at Seber Elementary. From there, she taught kindergarten at Eastlawn and Plymouth and then became the second grade teacher at Plymouth, which is where she is today. Uh, Anne earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in elementary education from Saginaw Valley State University. You were nominated by parents and colleagues. Mm. Isn't that special? That is special. Among their comments were the following. You go out of your way to make sure students feel important and show them how loved and valued they are. You are a rock star with an exclamation point. I like that. Uh, this parent said that her son has anxiety and was having a hard time coming to school. And uh, this parent encouraged him to talk to you to see if you could help, and you absolutely did. You were able to help him turn his day around and be successful. You are so positive and kind. You are a shining star. You're a team player that often flies under the radar. You're willing to accompany students who need a break, even on your prep time and you have a strength in building classroom culture around kindness. Oh, she's crying. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. That's so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. This is for you. Thank you. 
Always one of the best parts of the night. Um, next up, item 3.2, are professional learning communities. So we have five uh, team members here tonight, Velashni Marugan, Keith Seibert, Tila Sherman, Scott Cochran, and Shannon Blazy. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being here, team. I'm excited for them to share with you our journey of professional learning communities. Uh, they're going to help you understand our why, and I'll just share to sort of put this in the right framework in your thinking. This is somewhat similar to the, learning, the Literacy Leadership Network presentation we had. This is about uh, building adult capacity to impact student learning, and that's the storyline you're going to hear that ultimately this is about stu student growth and learning and achievement. So thanks for being here. All right. Thank you very much for having us. Um, this is something that we've been working on for a while um, at, at different spots in each of our buildings. I know at Northeast we dove into this several years ago, and now we have all secondary buildings kind of on board and pursuing this and trying to implement it. Um, with, the, with our staff. But the idea of a professional learning community um, really came about in, with Richard DeFore's work in 1998. And the focal point is to aim at getting teachers out of their individual classrooms and collaborating together because knowledge is a limited resource and no single person has, you know, the monopoly on that. And getting people to come together to share um, ideas things that work, things that didn't work, um, with a focus on student results. And if you look at the first slide there, it gives you, I'm not going to read that directly to you, but it, it, meeting together as a collaborative team is an ongoing process um, that's focused on the results for each student and pursuing excellence and achievement for each student. Um, a misconception out there is that we, and, and we, I say this at times, that we have PLCs in our building, but the idea of a professional learning community is really the umbrella. And it is made, that is the umbrella, and then underneath that are the individual collaborative teams in your building. And so research says that those teams need to be made up or they need to be made up or based on the content that you teach or the grade level to get the maximum benefit of that. And that's what we're, that's what we're pushing for. And the teams come together, and it takes a huge amount of vulnerability and transparency because, and that's where this hasn't always happened, because you have to show all your cards um, to fellow colleagues, and you have to say what hasn't worked or what, what is working, and you're sharing student results with others that you're working with for the benefit of improving student performance. Um, the three big ideas of a PLC are the purpose, that all students can learn at high levels, a culture of collaboration, working interdepend interdependently, and focus on results, data-driven dri decisions. Uh, at Northeast, and I know at the other buildings, we try to triangulate our data that we're getting. So we look at daily formative assessments, we look at unit tests, we look at um, our scales that we're using. We'll focus on the NWEA scores and then we'll focus on the state assessments and we look at all three of those pieces together to come up with the best decisions moving forward or what needs to change instructionally to enhance student learning. Our next slide says why collaborate? Well, obviously two minds are better than one. I'll share a a personal example that I shared with our staff, and I hope that it's relevant for you or you can relate with this, but a couple of years ago, my daughter was in eighth grade at Northeast. We had a situation, a health scare with her, where she passed out. She was running a very, very high temperature. Um, my wife called me at work and said, do you think I should take her in? I said, absolutely. We took her over to MidMichigan Healthcare, and we got her in there and they were running all sorts of tests and they couldn't figure out what was going on with her. Um, they did not have, and to my knowledge, they don't have a full pediatric you know, level at the mid-Michigan. And the doctor came to us and said, I don't know what this is, I have a suspicion, but I know I gotta get you out of here. And so they put her in the back of an ambulance and over to Saginaw Covenant we went. And once over there, they started running test after test after test. As the evening went on, her kidneys were failing. Um, she was starting, they were gonna move her into ICU. 
and somehow at some point they came up with what they believed was wrong with her and they started treating it and she started to improve um, the next morning my wife stayed up there but the next morning when I was there I have never felt like in better hands because it wasn't just one doctor that came in there were six and all of them were they had all their notes they all had clip clipboard and they were comparing notes with each other as they were sharing with us and the idea behind that is is I'm forever thankful for the individual that was here that knew he didn't have all the answers and he sent us to a team and that is the same idea here with the students at Northeast at Midland High at Dow at Jefferson is that we're coming together as a team to look at the needs of individual students and try to improve what we're doing as a school and as teachers to get better outcomes for the kids. And so with that, I will pass it over to Scott. Hi, good evening. I'm Scott Cochran, principal at HH Dow High School, and thanks for having us here tonight. And that was a, wow, that was a beautiful story um, of collaboration. And we were actually talking, uh, Penny made people cry with her presentation we thought that there's no way ours in a good way I said a good way we thought there's no way ours can but maybe it could maybe it could um, so uh, to transition to something uh, the, the critical questions of learning are PLCs what do they do or what do they talk about so our groups are focused on uh, what is commonly called the DeForest four and Rick DeForest work he he talks about four different questions that PLCs could could take a look at what do we want students to know? How will we know they've learned it? Um, what will we do for students that are struggling to learn? And how will we extend learning for those that already know? So however you phrase it, those four questions make up the core of the work that our PLCs are doing. And what does that look like? Well, typically our groups are about two to five teachers working together. As Keith said, you know, uh, the, uh, bringing a team together is uh, better than just having one person working independently. And what I shared when we talked about it at Dow High, we talked about the idea that I said, I don't, this isn't meant to be one more thing. This isn't a burden. This isn't um, an extension of your workday in a negative way. This should be the best thing for you. This should be something that you look forward to because you're having an opportunity to collaborate and work with other professionals who are doing same or similar things to you and you get to talk about what's really important to you. So um, that's our goal for the PLCs. How does this look like? How do these four questions translate to an, an hour long conversation? It could be lots of different things. We have PLCs that are focused on or, or moving towards focusing on power standards. If you have a whole uh, shaft of things that you're teaching, a whole range of, of uh, standards that you're teaching in your class, how do you pick out what's most important to build on? Well, that's one of the things that our groups can talk about. How do you measure? What types, of, what types of assessment do we use? How do we know that those assessments are working to measure what we want them to measure? Do they look the same across the board in different classes? What are the results of, the, of those assessments? So how will we know what students have learned? And then when we talk about interventions or how do we help students that are struggling or extension, how do we help students that already know? We want everybody to be engaged. We want everybody to grow in their learning. Uh, and that can be a real challenge. Uh, so talking with colleagues that are doing that can be really meaningful. And I'd like to point out one other thing too. Some of our PLCs are really subject focused. We might have a number of teachers who are teaching world history, for example, or biology, or whatever it might be. And they can talk about really specific content uh, standards. We have other groups that are not that. They are teachers who are teaching sort of independent singleton classes, and they're talking about ways of learning. They're talking about learning skills. How do we develop that across the board? Or maybe we have, a, we have a group that's ninth through 12th grade, and they're focusing on one skill, and how does it grow as students are working their way through Dow High School. So it can look like lots of different things, and that's part of what makes it really valuable, as the teacher's able to kind of drive the train um, and we help them in that process. But they're able to pick what's meaningful and important to them. So uh, our, we have a couple of big ideas that we wanted to highlight for you. Obviously, we want to make sure that all students learn. And when we talk about learning, when we talk about what happens in school, in class, it's about teaching and learning. And sometimes, maybe more in the past than in the present day, we would focus on 
the teaching side of it, and you have to focus on the teaching side of it. It's what you do, but the job is not done when the teaching has happened, right? It's not, well, I presented the information and, hey, I hope they get it. Um, and that's obviously not where our teachers are, but that can be a real challenge when you present the information and students don't get it, or you take students through learning experiences and they're still struggling, or they're feeling bored like they already know it. So now what? What do you do next? And sometimes it feels like that's, that's where the real magic sauce happens, and that's, uh, that's certainly a topic and something we focus on in PLCs. So to make sure that everybody is learning, everybody is growing, um, and that we're not just teaching the topics, but the students are learning. So that's one of our big ideas. And I know any of us could do this entire presentation, so um, I'm going to turn it over to V to take a look at our next question. Oh, so my name is Veloshni Murugan. I'm a secondary curriculum specialist here at Midland Public. So I'm going to be talking to you about big idea number two, which is collaboration. And PLC allows our teachers to collaborate in ways that they have not. You may ask us, well, haven't, or you may say, haven't they been collaborating their whole career? Yes, they have, but now it's more focused. During P the PLC time, they're focused on students. They're focused on the four main questions, which is where are our students, where are, where are our students now, where are they going, how do we know that they're there, and if they're there, how do we, how do we um, help those that have not achieved the standards that we hope that they would achieve, and then those that have achieved the standards, how do we extend that learning? And during the PLC time, New teachers are supported by veteran teachers. We get to share all types of ideas, new ideas, um, best practices. Um, and during that time, teachers also get to build their knowledge, build their um, skill level, and they get to practice and try new ways that they maybe probably couldn't have thought about um, if they were working independently. And so here are seven ways in which teachers collaborate during the PLC time, but I'm going to highlight a few. Um, every PLC group has common goals that they work towards, and as they achieve those goals, they continue to change them. The team is always focused on those four critical questions. They're always trying to find ways to improve students, um, the pro uh, improve the students' achievements, um, and so. They move from a model where they focus on their own individual classes to now focusing on all students in the grade level. And it moves away from specific students to focusing on specific skills that students may need. Um, and it's also focused on learning. Time is scheduled during the day. Sometimes it's after school. Um, we have had PD days where we've um, had um, teachers collaborate. We've, this year we've had a couple of days where teachers were um, able to meet, um, you know, from uh, middle school all the way to high school, and they were able to vertically align all of their standards. And in that way, they were able to see what standards are still relevant, you know, what standards they could maybe skip or kind of go, go light on. And so I feel like with the PLC time, this has been a game changer for our teachers. Thank you. Okay, I'm Shannon Blazy. I'm the principal of uh, Jefferson Middle School. And um, the uh, third big idea is all about results. Um, we do assess our effectiveness on the basis of results rather than intentions or how we feel things should be. Um, this is all data driven. And um, this, this uh, brings us together as far as individuals, but teams, and um, again, highlighting the collaboration. And it produces meaningful teamwork for all of us. Um, the results are goal oriented. As a matter of fact, in our PLCs, um, this is where we create SMART goals. And um, the SMART goals are able to change over time depending on what we've achieved. And again, data from the students is driving our decisions on what we're doing um, in our PLCs and in the instruction in the classroom. So this is a, a for some, it's a big culture shift. Um, and um, so we're changing our focus. In the old, more traditional method of teaching, we would say every student can learn. Um, now we're saying every student will learn. Um, it really gives us um, the ability to look not just as a group of students, a class of students, or um, even just even a select few of students. We can look at individuals and really read that data and see what else can we do to help them succeed. 
Um, our focus is, has always been on teaching, um, but now we're really focusing in on learning. Um, we are consistently analyzing with each lesson what is or is not being learned, and then adjusting our instruction uh, based on that. Um, it used to be a little more that people would um, be in their own classrooms, just be a little more isolated and do their thing and be very creative with their teaching. Um, but now, um, with the collaborative effort, um, like he said earlier, more heads are better than one, and the ideas that are shared are just um, amazing, first of all. But also, I can speak from uh, my perspective at Jefferson. Um, I have a large turnover. Um, in the last three years, I've had about 23 new staff members come to Jefferson, and I have more to go. Um, and so all of these newer teachers or newer teachers to the building get to hear what we're doing, get they're getting on the same page, and um, we're going down the same path, which is very efficient um, as far as uh, what we want to do in our teaching. Um, but yes, sharing ideas on strategies and methods and um, teaching each other. Um, the assessment of learning, so a more summative approach is more of the old way of teaching where maybe after a unit we'd teach, after a unit, you know, did, how did everybody do? We'd give a test. Okay, well, now we have our results on how they did. Um, now what we're doing more and more is learning methods of formative assessment. So it can be a daily assessment, actually. We're looking day to day to see how the students are learning, and um, that informs our teaching. So I can, I can go back in the classroom ne the next day, and I can see, based on my formative assessment, you know what, we need to, um, we need to work on uh, this standard or we need to work on this particular area of our subject that we're learning right now. So it's a day-to-day -day, um, formative assessment um, method that we are using. Um, and failure was, I suppose, an option, not in my world, but okay. Um, you know, I know we all strive for nobody to fail as teachers, but um, failure is certainly not an option um, with the method with PLCs that we're using right now. Okay. Hi, I'm Tila Sherman. I'm the principal at Midland High School, and I have the really difficult slide of, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Happy to answer. <laughs> are any questions you might have? That means they put you on the spot, though, yeah, to yeah. answer the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. This is really helpful and, and informative. As a one thought that went through my mind as we went through this is how do we support you as a board mm -hmm. in the work that you do in the professional learning communities? I think, well, and jump in if I'm way out of line, I think one of the um, asks um, from our teachers is the gift of time, and we've tried to be very intentional about building out our PD structure to grant that gift of time. It's still a little cumbersome in that we have so many things that teachers are, um, we're proud of it, but there's a lot of learning that our teachers get to engage in throughout the year, and it, and their time, they're just time consuming, and so the gift of time um, is tremendously helpful. Uh, we've also been very intentional as a principal group. We have our own PLC uh, group, and um, it's been quite lovely to come out of our silos. We have this healthy competitiveness. I don't know if you know of it. Um, <laughs> um, but when we walk in the door, we walk in the room and we close the door and we're quite vulnerable and say, okay, here's where I'm struggling as a principal. Here's my data as a principal. What are you doing? And um, that is relatively new for me, uh, a new experience for me at, in Midland Public Schools. I've experienced it in other districts, but it's been quite lovely and quite refreshing um, to have that gift of time. So um, I think when you continue to have conversations around PD calendar or PD structure or PD, um, what that calendar looks like, uh, really allowing us uh, the time to to take risks and make mistakes and 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 not um, weaponize data. So data is really a tool for us to analyze what we're doing right and what we can improve upon, as opposed to it's a, it's a a form to say 
what are you doing wrong? How come you're not measuring up? It's really just a, 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 a talking point, if you will, to help us grow. How much time would we need to give you? You know, it, it depends. It de I think Northeast is in a different space than we are. Um, I, the, I think the hours after school has helped a little bit because it's been throughout the year, but do you guys have any major suggestions on what time looks like? I don't know right now. I thought you were the one that was going to handle the question. <laughs> <laughs> we're a team. Some we're a team. Of, <laughs> team. Collaborating. I like Collaborating. it. <laughs> Some of it de is dependent on the work that they're engaged in at that time. So I know at Northeast currently the teachers are, they're mandated to, to meet together as a collaborative team three times a month. And they do that during their conference and planning period. And I'm not saying that's the model that has to work in each building, but that's what has worked so far. But that hour time slot or a 55-minute time slot sometimes is not enough of a prolonged period that you can. It's kind of like you just get started on something and then you have to finish because you got you got to go back to class, which is normal. I mean, that's what has to be. But... Um, one of the starting points that the buildings are looking at are taking a look at the standards. I, I, I heard it recently uh, was told that if, if we taught every standard for like seventh grade, for example, uh, K-12, let's just do that, it, I guess it would be 22 years to get through everything. That's how much is in there. And so the work of identifying the power standards, the essential standards, what is it that we have to focus on in seventh grade English this year to make sure that our students are equipped? And that's just one example, but that takes time to go through that, to identify that, and then once you've identified the standard, to unpack it. And so that takes a little bit more time. And so when you're asking how much, I don't really have a specific answer. Sometimes we've looked at a half a day release time where the teachers are working together. Sometimes it's summer work. Um, it just is dependent on the task at hand. And are the team, and how developed the team is as well. Are there opportunities for like Jefferson teachers to work with Northeast teachers and mm -hmm. Dow and Midland on an ongoing basis? Yes, this year we've had um, school days where teachers were able to collaborate as a PLC all, for example, science teachers came together and did, they did some learning. They vertically aligned um, all of their standards. So, and then each one was able to see what they were doing. Um, but this summer, we we're hoping to get together um, about 20 teachers, all the principals, the secondary principals, our learning coaches, and um, to unpack those standards. It's very important for teachers before they align or uh, identify their power standards to understand what they mean. And so hopefully this summer we're going to be able to do it and uh, bring in some outside consultants to help us with that. Any, uh, anybody else have any further questions? <coughs> Not that I want you to do any more work than you already do. <laughs> But, <laughs> but yes. is it possible for us as a board, because this is a presentation that is wonderful, but it's also a little bit abstract for us because we can't see the teams that are in all the buildings. Is that something that you could share with us? Not right this second. But. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, our doors are open. You can come through Jefferson anytime, I'm sure, any of the other schools. And it's amazing just to be able, you can come on in any of the rooms that we're collaborating in our PLCs, and you will hear, um, you will hear academic conversation on assessments. You'll hear topics on uh, teaching strategies. You'll hear the data being analyzed. So um, anytime, come on in. I would also I would also say that um, in addition to that, always welcome at Dow High, of course. Um, I would also say to be happy to send information, whether it's through the curriculum office or through Penny, whatever would make sense on just like what some of our PLC groups are at Dow High, and I'm sure at the other buildings too. And then what are some of the goals that they're working toward right now, and then what do we anticipate that looking like next year? If that would be helpful as well, with uh, that would be beneficial. Some yes. more specifics. Absolutely. Yeah, we can put something like that together. Absolutely. Thank you. I just want to take a moment to maybe brag about this team here. And Dirk isn't with us tonight, but he certainly has been part of this as well. Uh, we 
when Tila said that this is um, kind of a new endeavor for our secondary principals to be together in a room regularly as their own learning community, I think we shouldn't sell that short. And I know there have been some hard conversations. Uh, you used a great word, uh, Tila, when you said you have to be vulnerable and you have to admit the things that you don't know individually and collectively. And we are asking our teacher PLC groups to do that as well. And when you're at that point, you need to go out and seek that information from experts. And so thank you to all of you uh, for your willingness to hang in there and keep working through this. I know it's not easy work. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're doing this. All right, next on the agenda is the superintendent search process update. Um, just give a brief update and a reminder that we have a special meeting scheduled for 6 p.m. this Wednesday where we will hear from the two candidates on their vision for the district and provide the board uh, an opportunity to, to engage in dialogue and questions and answers with each of the candidates um, and then make a selection thereafter. So one more really big step in the process um, and I also want to say thank you to everybody that was involved in the day in the district and provided feedback we've been um, receiving emails to the board account as well as uh, feedback through the HYA portal so thank you um, next up is item number four request to address the board uh, first on my list was um, Spencer Topfer. Welcome, Spencer. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm, uh, I'm here tonight asking for you to review and update your disciplinary standards and policies for Midland Public Schools. I come to you as a concerned community member and, more importantly, a concerned parent. The interim superintendent is quoted as saying, the people who make our district great, from bus drivers to teachers and building support staff and coaches and many more people along the way, we take pride in how well we serve the community and we understand how quickly, quickly we can sink into mediocrity if we take our eyes off the goal. I'm afraid we are on the cusp or just beyond the sinking into mediocrity stage. You see, the MPS Code of Conduct lists 35 prohibitive acts. The Code of Conduct further states, in every case, the school district will consider restorative practices as an addition or an alternative to suspension or expulsion. I am fully aware children aren't perfect, nor are they expected to be perfect. I am also painfully aware that restorative practices, while by and large should suffice, lack the necessary consequences to correct poor behavior, bad choices, etc., and leave much to be desired. Unfortunately, this topic requires far more than three minutes to address. One might subscribe to the broken window theory, which simply states visible signs of disorder or misbehavior only encourage further acts. As a parent, I expect my school district to provide and foster an environment where my child can learn and grow. However, I am made aware of instances of vaping, theft, vandalism, scholastic dishonesty, and failure to comply, just to name a few. The same names come up with consequences that are far too lenient, evidenced by the same infractions committed by the same people over and over. Restorative practices do have their place, but I am more concerned with the district and their overall lack of support for staff. Teachers can write all the referrals they want, but behaviors rarely change. Instances that should result in suspension or even expulsion appear to be kicked down the road, and the fix is simply to transfer the student to one school or another and start the whole process over. Revamping the code might be too much of a lift. Perhaps you should support staff and school administrators with the fair but judicial application of punishment. The goal should be to correct behavior, but if the behavior or actions are not changed, do not sacrifice the rest of the student's ability to learn by keeping the bad apples in the mix. Students will learn more, and let's face it, teachers can spend more time teaching instead of drafting referrals or babysitting the troublemakers. Think about the teachers having the support of their own admin and admin having the support of the school district. That alone will lead to higher morale and a better outcome for students and staff alike. Teachers have a hard enough time without always being second-guessed or treated guilty until proven otherwise. The news recently posted Miami Beach spring break restrictions made the city safer, calmer, and busier. Imagine that, setting rules, enforcing the rules, and it equates to adjectives like safe and calmer. Imagine a classroom or even a school in general where the rules were not only enforced, but in such a matter that promotes learning, keeps the educators, staff, and children safe, 
That can be Midland Public Schools. As a board, I implore you to reevaluate the disciplinary paradigm. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Spencer. Thank you. Joe Bonides. <laughs> Greetings. My wife and I have been coming to these meetings for over two years. Speaking for myself, I've learned a lot along the way, many of which I've been very disappointed in. During the early stages of the superintendent's search, there was much discussion about how Shero was undercompensated. Since Midland is exceptional, we did not go to the mean. We went to the exceptional end of the spectrum. We used Troy as the benchmark, which is 60% larger than we are, and we came up with a salary increase of 72% to 320000 with a 20% bonus possible, which would double Sharrow's pay plus related benefits. And then we selected HYA as your search firm to make sure you had a good coverage across a large area of geography as well as demographics. The justification for these actions were summarized well by Mr. Lauterbach as, quote, we don't want the usual suspects. Just something to consider as we move forward. My wife sent you all a long letter several weeks ago. Seems that the Thrun Law Shield you all put up 18 months ago needed some supporting documents to be legal. They were not there since the previous document was dated September 2022. After repeated mentions and the long call-out letter we, you received, we received another denial that there weren't, weren't any issues. So keep paying the clairvoyant actual bill generated before the actual FOIA records were collected. We did notice that the new policy miraculously appeared as and updated on September 27th, just before the long overdue response to the letter we sent in. It just didn't acknowledge the cost issues mentioned in the letter, but does send us to court, so you guys don't need to be bothered. When the interim superintendent called my wife, she neglected to even tell us of the new policy. She, uh, she also said MPS will continue to charge for the agenda package without proper justification, thus still not acknowledging the documentation requirements in FOIA. When my, ice, my wife asked why her aforementioned letter was not on the agenda as a letter to the board, we were informed that there is no policy that all letters be included on the agenda, nor in your package. We knew emails sent to the board members uh, were not acknowledged on the agenda, and now we know actual USPS and hand-delivered correspondence can also be excluded as well. We were apparently deluding ourselves that the agenda indicated a level of public interaction with the board, so yet another opaque appearance of transparency. Lastly, your superintendent timeline talks about Wednesday's meeting and a decision by April 16th. I would like to know when you all will have your public discussion for that decision. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bonadies. Uh, Renita Bonadies. Good evening. Given that there was already a motion in a prior special meeting, this board seems very determined to hire Ms. Miller Nelson for the position of superintendent. For your job is to hire the most qualified candidate to lead. We're asking why this board is settling and paying top dollar for someone that is not fully qualified according to the board's own job description. We heard how she doesn't really have the financial background, but it was laughed off with, that's what we have Brian for. Again, do we pay top dollar for someone and expect someone else to fulfill a critical part of their job? If you did not get a good candidate in the pool, the board needs to ask why. If the district is in the top 5%, why didn't the top 5% of potential candidates apply? When funding changes drastically and hits a fiscal cliff, what will MPS do then? Can Ms. Miller Nelson really navigate the overhaul that would be needed to the curriculum, staffing, and overall driving forces of the community stakeholders to make the hard decisions to accommodate these changes? Or can she adjust to the budget and spending to handle all of the lost federal funding to MPS? These are the real conversations that need to be taking place, not that she's really nice and everyone likes her. Although Dr. Reed may not have a long tenure with MPS, as was noted by the board, he's what MPS needs at this time. He's been in many different school environments and positions, which gives him a vast understanding. He's the type of person to bring this community back and put the focus on all scholars. We've heard many times over the past two and a half years of attending board meetings about the LBGTQ and the elite students, the 5%, 
that have the loudest voices in support of the community stakeholders. What about the rest of the population? The lower income and disabled students, the 35%, seem to be kept where they are because the di district gets more funding by having them in this category. Where are the programs to raise them out of these situations and help them grow as scholars? Dr. Reed has implemented real solutions to help a much broader segment of the student body and their families. He said, I really believe in making sure that we're preparing our scholars for the future. And something that's critical to me is meeting scholars where they're at. That comes with belief. As far as financial background, Dr. Reed has 42 schools and three charter schools under his purview, where he has supported curriculum and managed a budget of $700 million. He has implemented cost-saving strategies, focused on hiring diverse staff, and collaborated with new college partnerships to increase retention. Look at the real background and skills to take MPS to new levels, not just tweak things. Some have knowledge, but some have knowledge and a vision. The choice is simple, choose knowledge and vision. Thank you. Next up is Gigi Hong. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you. Hi, my name is Gigi Hong, and I'm the president of Go Green Club at Dow High, and I'd like to address some sustainability and climate actions in our community and schools and why it's important to have collaboration and communication with the school district and the school board. So climate justice, climate action, climate change, all of these words isn't just a concept, but it's our immediate reality, and we can see that with <coughs> see that now with our weather patterns, we can see that in the loss of nature. We can see that in the impact on marginalized communities. And these are all things that impact our community in Midland and our students um, and the, the people in our district at Midland Public Schools. And within the high schools, there are a lot of students interested in sustainability and a lot of students that understand the importance of taking sustainable actions and why it's important to do it now. And we can see that through the initiatives that Go Green as well as Midland High's Green Club has um, taken throughout the years. But it also doesn't stop here. We, it doesn't stop at the high schools. We've been communicating with the other s schools in the district as well as the middle schools, including the middle schools, and we've seen that their students have also expressed interest in sustainability and, and also understand the importance. So we're seeing interest and we're seeing students of all ages and people of all ages understanding and being interested in this idea. And this leads them to take action in their own schools with sustainability, including well, specifically recycling. Just last week, I, as, as well as other officers and members of Go Green, went to Northeast to help them conduct a waste audit. So we took samples of trash in their school, and then we sorted through it in the middle of their um, cafeteria to show students what we were doing and why it was important. And this is just one example of students taking the lead, because we saw the students, we saw reactions, and that's what's important. We saw people that were disgusted by the trash, we saw people that were shocked, we saw people that were interested, and that's <coughs> what we were there for. We were trying to garner attention, garner their attention of why this was important, and something that may, they might not have known before. And this is students, middle schoolers, high schoolers, taking the lead on sustainable action. But one day, we won't just be students taking the lead. One day, we're going to be making decisions that will impact generations to come, just as the generations before us did. And having the opportunity to collaborate with you sets not only an outstanding example, but we'll be able to achieve much more with much longer lasting effects. Midland Public Schools, inspiring excellence. I mean, you can see it's all around you. Leading with respect and trust and ensuring opportunities for inclusivity, collaboration, and achieving success. And addressing the climate crisis is a part of these goals and an aspect of allowing us to achieve this idea. And what better time than the present? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Uh, Kaylin Liu. Hi, my name is Kaylin Liu, and I'm a sophomore at Dow High and a member of Go Green. 
I'd like to speak tonight about how important it is that we take action in our community in the face of the climate crisis. Climate change affects everyone, and because of this, it's important that we not only implement sustainable practices throughout the district, but that we also educate future generations about climate change, who will have to deal with the, dis the, the disastrous effects it could have in the future, <coughs> including but not limited to atmospheric warming, more extreme weather events, and loss of biodiversity, which in turn can pose dangers to human health. Adopting sustainability into the K-12 through curriculum can have positive effects in creating future generations that are more knowledgeable, environmentally conscious, and willing to commit to preserving the climate and helping make a difference. This is a concrete step that we can take to positively impact the, cli the climate crisis. And by taking actions such as these, we can safeguard the future the of the planet. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylin. Gigi and Kaylin, if there are other specific actions to engage with the board on, please reach out. And we're happy to have those conversations with you. Um, some of our work previously has been around um, an energy performance bond, um, which has allowed us to reduce our energy usage and then take those dollars and put them in the classroom instead. So if there are other opportunities specifically like that where we can help to achieve your um, your goals and ambitions for the district, please, please reach out. That was everyone that I had on our list. Um, is there anybody else that would like to address the board? Thank you. My name is John Kawicki, and I wasn't going to say anything because of that gentleman didn't hear anymore. Um, I said, now is my time. Uh, four months ago, I, I, let me put it this way, I love Midland. I absolutely love Midland. Of my 77 years, 73 of them have been put here in Midland. After military, I came back here because I love Midland. Four months ago, I had the opportunity to run into the Dean of Boys from Midland High School in 1965. And it was a privilege for me because we came up with a set of rules and regulations and if you violate the rules and regulations, you had to go see this man. We were out to dinner, and I said to my wife, I said, you see that man after he's done order? And, and I went out and I called his name out. I reintroduced myself, and I had a wonderful experience. And what I said to him was, I want to thank you for setting up an atmosphere of discipline, crucial in our society today. Um, Our children, my youngest child, graduated 35 years ago out of the Midland school system. It was different. What young people have to face today, uh, we didn't have to face that when we were young. And I've talked to a number of people since I met with this dean of boys. I said, do you remember problems in Midland High School? Dow High School hadn't been built yet. And they went, no, we had a wonderful experience. No, we had a wonderful experience. No, we had a wonderful experience because there were rules and regulations, and if you violate the rules, you had to see him, and he was fair. And his wife was with him, and I said, here's the deal, you were more than a teacher. And so we had a little conversation, and the guy's 93 years old now in Sharp. He remembered, he said, tell me what year you graduated, and he, he talked about different people he worked with. It was just a privilege for me. And she said something to me. She said, you said something that was really smart. And I went, oh, you better re refresh me on that because nobody ever says that to me. <laughs> and she said, you said they were more than teachers. And I said, I stand by that. They were more than teachers. And, um, you know, it's a different world today. And my dad gave me a spectacular piece of information when I graduated. He said, here's the deal. You need to know this, son. You are going to, um, uh, when you go out in the world, there are people that are going to criticize you no matter what you do. I'll bet you fell face that. No matter what you do, you have to know what you stand for. You don't violate your, your basic principles and um, hold the line. And Midland is a wonderful community. That's one of our problems. It's so darn good that a lot of people don't want to even challenge things. Uh, I've only got four seconds left. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for joining us. Anybody else?
Hi everyone, my name is Angelina and I am a sophomore at Dow High School and I'm also the first vice president of Go Green. So like Gigi and Kaylin have mentioned before, climate change is a pressing issue and it isn't kind of a distant threat, but it's currently knocking on our doors and it's requiring urgent action and attention. And we right now we have not only the want for improvement, but also the need. We have the people who care and the ability to acquire the resources we need. So now is the time we must act and work towards a more sustainable tomorrow and embracing sustainability isn't just about saving the planet it's about securing a brighter future for all it's about leveraging our role in our community creating equitable spaces and building resilient communities through education and as a community as a group and as a school district we are ready to learn adapt and lead a charge towards um, a sustainable future but we need your support we need bold policies that prioritize renewable energy, reduction in carbon footprint, and promote environmental, promoting environmental education. We need formal acknowledgement that climate change is real and a social justice issue. We need ongoing collaboration and communication within all the schools, the environmental clubs, teachers, as well as administrators. We need education, and we need to instill in our kids the importance of protecting the planet and provide them with opportunities to take action and make a difference in their communities. So let's not be remembered as the generation that ignored the warning signs, a school district that stood silent. Let's be remembered as the generation that rose up to the challenge and stood up for our planet and inspired change and excellence. So together, let's build a world where sustainability isn't just a buzzword, but a way of life. Let's build a world where there's consistent and constant collaboration between everyone who are, is passionate about building a more sustainable future. And let's show the world what a community and a school district committed to change can truly achieve through our influence and through education of younger generations and building them into leaders and members of society who can make a genuine impact and can help make the world a better place. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Angelina. Anybody else? Um, just to address one comment um, on superintendent search, we have our board meeting scheduled for 6 p.m. on Wednesday. I think we were pretty clear, but just to reiterate that my intention is that we make our selection on Wednesday night that's following the interviews. Yeah, so just wanted to make sure that we're all clear on that. Yeah, I think the reason that the April 16th was that will be the board meeting where we actually vote if there's a contract. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, seeing no other uh, people to address the board, we'll close the floor. Um, item five is curriculum instruction and assessment. And I believe we have Mr. Blazy with minutes from February 20th. Curriculum Instruction Assessment Study Committee Minutes from February 20th. Members present, myself, Jennifer Ringgold, Ann Horowitz, Penny Miller Nelson, Jen Service, Melissa Toner. Yes, we're Chris Waha, Joying Chow, and we met at Chestnut Hill Elementary School. Um, we had an update from Joy about diversity, <coughs> equity, and inclusion. A summary of recent events throughout the district was shared with highlights, including the Human Library event and the elementary book and crayon project. We also had a presentation of continuity of learning, continuity of learning plan. The plan was reviewed as it remains a requirement for several federal grants the district receives. Elementary literacy. The committee learned more about how the NWEA assessment is used to inform both small group and whole class introduction, instruction in elementary classrooms. Members then visited classrooms to see various instructional practices, such as small group instruction that aligns with the building improvement plan for Chestnut Hill. We adjourned at 2.45 and we met again earlier today. Thank you, Brad. Item number six is finance facilities and operations. Uh, Mr. Lauterbach, you have minutes? Sure. Thank you, Phil. The uh, FFO committee met on March 4th. Uh, members present were me, uh, Brad Blazy, Scott McFarland, Penny Miller Nelson, and Brian Brutin. Uh, we reviewed the January financials. There were no significant variances of note. Purchases over the bid threshold were reviewed. 
We discussed maintenance grounds and stadium HVAC. The administration will recommend awarding contracts to replace HVAC systems at various MPS locations. Energy and Series 2 bond funds will be utilized if approved. We also discussed crack filling, seal coating, and line repainting. The administration will recommend awarding a contract for lot work at various MPS locations. Capital improvement funds will be utilized if approved. Pre-primary center utilization in partnership with MPS Robotics leaders, the administration is seeking an alternate location to enhance team experiences. Relocating robotics will free up space for potential preschool program expansion. We discussed the Franklin Property Purchase Agreement. District Council is looking, uh, excuse me, is working on drafting a purchase agreement aligned to proposed terms between MPS and Habitat for Humanity. It will be presented to the board for consideration once it's been reviewed by administration. We talked about MFP wages. Feedback was solicited on a potential wage reopener of the current Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals contract. And finally, the facility study feedback on a draft timeline was solicited. Our next meeting will be Monday, April 8th at 5 p.m. Thanks. So item 6.2 is for action, crack filling, seal coating, and line striping. Mr. Bertin. Thank you, sir. Um, bids were solicited to seal coat, crack fill, and also to <coughs> repaint parking lines throughout the Midland Public Schools. Um, in your board packet is the specifications of the project scope. Um, administration is recommending that we award that project to Smith Line Striping and Seal Coating of Bertrand, Michigan for a total price of $79,450. And if approved this evening, we will utilize the district capital improvement funds. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> Is there a motion for item 6.2? So moved. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Hatfield. Any discussion on item 6.2? Hey, Brian. Um, see, we're using capital improvement funds, and we do this every year. Is there, a, is there a matching line item that goes with this, or we have set aside funds? Every single year, um, the Director of Operations, Mr. Mogenberg, and I sit down and we take a look at our total availability of capital improvement funds. And while we don't have a specific bucket for this, it usually comes up as a routine annual um, repeating line item. Um, this is something that I anticipate year over year. Uh, we have a lot of asphalt in this district, and if you don't stay on top of it, then you have to end up doing total replacements, and this is money well spent. Okay, thank you. Yep. Does this happen on... In the summer or yes, weekends? correct. Summer. It also involves repainting, okay. um, and so we have to make sure the kids are off of it, and we also have to get it done before band camp and yeah. sports and all of those. So that's why awarding the contract now gets us in line to be able to get that done. All in favor of item 6.2 say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 6.3, grounds HVAC replacement. Brian. Thank you. Um, we solicited bids to replace the HVAC equipment at the MPS grounds building across the street. Um, the complete specifications of the project scope were included in your board packet. We recommend awarding that project to Rolls Mechanical of Fenton, Michigan for a total price of $29,967.40. And we will utilize Series 2 bond funds for that project if we have your approval this evening. Accept the motion for approval of item 6.3. So moved. Support. Motion by Ladderbach, support by McFarland. Any discussion on this one? All in favor of the grounds HVAC replacement say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 6.4, maintenance transportation HVAC replacement. Brian. Thank you. We also sought bids to replace the HVAC equipment, as you just stated, at the maintenance and transportation building also across the street. We did include those specifications in your board packet as well, too. We are recommending that we award this project to Smiley Plumbing and Heating of Freeland, Michigan. The grand total for this project is $160,400, again, utilizing Series 2 bond funds if we have your approval this evening. So Thank you. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by McFarland. Any discussion on item 6.4? All in favor of approval of item 6.4 say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 6.5 for Action Midland Community Stadium 
Locker room HVAC replacement, Brian. Thank you. And the last in this series of approvals is the HVAC equipment bid that we put out for the stadium locker room building. We again uploaded the project specifications in your board packet. We're recommending the award of this project to Rolls Mechanical of Fenton, Michigan. The grand total for this project is $120,179.92. Again, utilizing Series 2 bond funds for this project if we have your approval. So moved. Support. Motion by Ladderbach, support by Ringgold. Any discussion? Brian, I'm assuming that this is not replaced when there were upgrades done after the lightning strike, if I recall. Is that completely it's separate? different building. Yep, that was the press box. Um, this is over there. And this area has received increased usage. We've put the golf simulator out there, which is also often used in our cold months. Um, and it was time for us to be able to replace that system. And this also includes controls, which will allow us to make sure that we're turning that on when we need to as well. Um, these are the last three areas of the district to get their total HVAC replacement done. Um, the next, of course, will be Dow High, which is in plan review right now. We anticipate that within the next couple of upcoming board meetings, but we'll have complete replacement of all HVAC systems in all of Midland Public Schools. These were the last buildings to get addressed because they're ones that don't typically have students in them, and we always want to make sure that the climate control follow the students first. Any further discussion? Oh, On, oh, oh did we already move yeah, it? Yeah, 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 you're good. <laughs> well, I'm still moving it. Fire tonight. <laughs> I'm, I, I am. Let's go. All in favor of approving item 6.5, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 6.6 .6 for action 23-24 budget amendment number one, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to present our first budget adjustment to you this evening of the 23-24 budget. I always start with the review of your timelines for you so you know where we are in the cycle. It gets a little bit confusing this time of year because we have two different things that are going on. Um, so tonight is addressing the 23-24 budget. This is changing the numbers that we have presented to you all the way back um, last June. And we are also going to be pre presenting to you in um, less than a month, your 24-25 budget workshop, where we're gonna give you our first initial glance at what we think the fiscal landscape for next year is. In, um, it seems short order, Jen pointed this out to me this evening. It's June 3rd, so it's early this year. That's when we are gonna to present to you our first draft of the 24-25 budget. And then a couple weeks after that, we will have two action items for you at the June 17th meeting, where we will ask you to approve a final amendment of the budget that you're gonna see this evening, and also the official adoption of the 24-25 budget. So lots of things are going on right now where we are working to refine this year's budget. And we are also in the preliminary phases of forecasting and developing next year's budget as well too. Um, here are your significant factors that we are gonna address this evening. And of course, timing and state funding, this is a repeated line item. If you've seen me present to you this the past five years, I have kept this and will keep saying this to you. You know that we present this to you the first week of June. It's gonna be June 3rd this coming year. And for us to be able to prepare all of the documents for your board packet, we lock ourselves in the second week of May. And as you know, um, sometimes the legislative arms do not have their final budgets to us by that time, which has been true um, in the past couple of cycles. So we are taking our best educated guesses. And as I'll point out to you with a couple of certain line items, those educated guesses, if we are off by a tenth or two tenths of a percent, can have pretty big swings for us when it comes to retirement rates. In our budget, we're dealing with about $53 million in salaries. So if we're off on our retirement rates by a tenth or two tenths of a percent, it can add up pretty quick. We always present to you conservative numbers um, to make sure that we are coming in always a little bit better um, in the end. So our other continued challenges is our reaction to categoricals. And you're gonna think I'm, I'm um, becoming a bit of a broken record on this, but this is something that we as a board need to be aware of. Um, the emergence of categoricals or separate line items of funding that are outside of our per pupil foundation have um, continued to be a challenge for us. They're a challenge one because each and every single year there are new categoricals that pop up. And when those categoricals pop up, those are things that we need to react to that we didn't build into our budget and often they're application-based. And when they are application-based, as you can see in that last line, um, that 
often presents a challenge to the Michigan Department of Education, who has to enact, develop, and um, set the regulations around those applications. And I'll give you a case in point. Our 31 AA application was approved two weeks ago. Um, that money was supposed to be available to us at the beginning of the year. It's a $1.7 million line item that we had to simply forecast. We didn't know how much we were going to get, and we didn't know until a couple of weeks ago that we were actually going to get those dollars and we can use them for what we wanted to. And so while we appreciate those line items, they've been a blessing for us to be able to sustain many initiatives. Um, those timelines have continued to be a challenge for us. This is also coupled with our predictions on whether or not they will renew. Um, year over year, when we have significant categoricals that are worth millions of dollars to MPS, foreshadowing if they will renew or not will often impact the different pot of which we are pulling numbers from. I want to give credit to our friends at the Saginaw ISD, um, and so you know that it's just not me trumpeting our issues with categoricals that we see year over year. If you just take a look at our chart here in fiscal year 2019, you could see that almost 65% of the state school aid budget was directed toward the per pupil funding or foundation allowance. And you can see that now in 2024, it's nearly 50-50. And so that means that the discretionary funding that comes with those foundation allowance dollars continues to diminish and these get pushed into certain line items that often come with application base, regulations, et cetera. Again, we appreciate those line items, but the more red tape that's wrapped around them, um, the more work that it is for our team to be able to get those in the hands of students and to be able to react to the flexibility that we need to know year over year. I'll highlight this a little bit deeper in our budget workshop, but do know um, that this is a real challenge and is also echoed by many of our regional and state colleagues as well too. So here's your noteworthy topics for the evening that are gonna affect the bottom line numbers that you'll see in a few slides. The retirement rates and cost offsets. Um, as I told you, just in salaries alone, we're about $53 million in this budget. And so when we have to lock in the second week of May, um, we usually lock in conservatively. And when those rates come in and the offsets that we believe that we're gonna get from the state, when you're off by fractions of a percent, those can then learn, lean into hundreds of thousands of dollars in adjustments. The weighted funding formula continues to be an emphasis in Lansing. Um, we are in great support of this. And one of the things that the budget included this year was a full 100% foundation, we'll call it kicker, for each of our special education students. So what that means is in addition to certain reimbursements, we're also getting two FTE or two foundation allowances for each and every single student that has special education needs with the amount of special education students that we have in MPS. If you remember that from the data presentation a couple back, this was a significant adjustment for us. SR3, um, I have two more board meetings to talk about this, and then you'll never hear me talk about it again. Um, but we, when we are forecasting our budgets for you all, did not know if certain categoricals were going to exist. And so now we know when mental health support categoricals exist, we can move them from one budget to another and we've continued to react to that. And so you will see me adjust those numbers one more time and then we'll have to talk about the sustainment of those initiatives into the next fiscal year. Transportation was new for us this year. The state included a categorical offset to assist us with our transportation fees alone. Um, we did not expect that, you'll see that adjustment. And then interest rates is something that I would like to mention as well too. Um, your business office is hard at work for you in putting um, significant time into maximizing interest rates with a healthy fund balance and interest rates that continue to be in the 5.2 to 5.3% rate. Um, our goal this year is to be able to make a million dollars in interest off of our general fund, which can do great things for kids. So you'll see a significant adjustment when it comes to that as well too. When we were locking in last June, we did not anticipate that those rates would stay as high as they were for as long as they were. And with our fund balance coming in where it did, it allows us with freed up cash flow to be able to invest those rates in safe, sustainable investments that are getting a great return for you as a board. There's a lot here. And I understand from your feedback over time um, to not bore you with each and every single one of these lines, but I do wanna make a commitment to transparency with you. 
as our budget grows each and every single year, you'll see that my amount shifts that I'm presenting to you in this. We have very detailed spreadsheets behind all of these, but our significant revenue changes year over year. We're gonna highlight for you the ones that are over $400,000. Before we get into specific line items and talk about some of those, there's two main things that you wanna pay attention to on this slide. Take a look at the very bottom where it says original versus amended. It's about a general $10 million increase in revenues than what we had foreshadowed for you when we first presented to you in June of last year. Very significant items that I'd like to highlight for you. Um, when we are talking about 147 C's in our educational speak, that means retirement costs. So as I said for you, when we estimate those retirement costs, um, if we are off by fractions of a percent, those can have significant um, impacts on our budget. Every single one of those lines, you'll see that they may have a little C in brackets after them. Basically what that means is we have revenues coming in, but there are direct costs associated with them going on the out. So you will see corresponding expenditures on the other side. Um, you'll see some other line items there that I'd mentioned in your previous slide. Special education, that was a significant boost for us when they moved from 75% of an FTE bonus to 100% to the tune of about a million extra dollars. You'll also see 30D, which in our speak means free lunch and free breakfast for all of our students. We did not anticipate those revenues. Um, those are direct revenues that are coming to us from the state and those are offsetting the cost for providing those free meals for our students. I talked about the categorical health supports continued support for CTE equipment that you guys have seen come to you through board resolutions. Our interest, when I say 600,000, that's additional revenues versus what we had forecast for you. So again, our goal is to get closer to that million dollar in interest this year. Um, the transportation line I had talked with you about, and then of course, building our full grant funding as well too. Again, very detailed breakdowns for these are available behind the scenes, but for this presentation and for your um, eye health, um, it simply can't be done um, to go through line by line in a budget that has thousands of lines to it. In terms of expenditures, I direct you first to the bottom. Our original budget was about 108.3, and at amended now, we are just short of 113 million. So you're seeing an adjustment in the range of about $4.5 million in expenditures. Our secret code on this slide is that if there is an R in brackets, that means that there are direct revenues associated to those costs. So those are offset on the other slide. So of note is there was not an expenditure adjustment over $400,000 that we did not receive a direct revenue stream to address. So if you're starting to do that math in your head, all of our significant expenditure adjustments were associated to retirement, which we received a revenue offset for, mental health supports, which we received a categorical offset for. You could see the same with at risk and school meals and CTE equipment and our other title funds that we have. So for each of those significant increases in expenditures, there were direct revenues associated for them. So um, Phil, this is your slide, sir, <laughs> that you asked for me each and every single time. So I have included and updated that for you. Um, this now shows that your expenditures by function, which is showing you where the dollars in our funds are um, going to. And you could see highlighted in red at the bottom that the largest significant portion of our budget is going directly to instruction and student supports. It's now at 78.2%. We're about 0.8 or 1% up from where we were the last time. So even with all the adjustments, we've sustained that and continued to invest heavily where we believe that our dollars should be going and that's directly into the classroom. There's another way to break this down. We don't typically provide that, um, but when you are doing that um, in a different way, salaries and benefits continue to be the largest portion of this budget. We're right in the 82, 83% range right now, which is typical um, for us. So we are a human organization. It is where most of our capital goes. It's into that human resources, salary and benefits line. When it all breaks down, you have two columns. Your column on the left in black shows your original June budget, and you can follow our revenues and expenditures all the way to the bottom where we were expecting to have a shortfall of around $2.6 million in our budget. When you redo the math and you add the additional 
approximately $10 million in revenues, and you add the additional $4.5 million in expenditures, remembering that each of our significant expenditures had a revenue offset, this is a positive adjustment for you at this time. We are anticipating that we are going to, with a historic 2% variance, end the budget um, with a surplus of approximately $2.8 million, which will put your fund balance right around 31.1% or $35 million. What I do want to point out for you is this does not include any fund modifications at this time. We don't typically do that until June. What a fund modification is, is when we take a look, Brad, at what you just pointed out, our capital improvement forecast for the next year, and we will take dollars from our general fund. We will push them into our capital improvement funds to be able to address those critical infrastructure projects over the next year. Historically, board, um, that's been in the one to $1.5 million range. Sometimes it edges up into the $1.75 to $2 million range. So we take a look at that forecasting after we build our next fiscal year budget and we make sure that we have the funds set aside to do so. So with that adjustment, um, that leads us to what our key budget drivers are. Um, I, again, will bring these to you one more time. You will see me present these numbers modified on June the 17th. That will include our final revisions on our revenues and expenditures. We'll fine tune those. Know that we always, as a district, will be a touch conservative because as Jessica points out to you from Yo and Yo, if we are off on any of those lines and predict under, we get an audit finding, which is not something that we want in a school district. So that's why we typically have a historic variance that's in that 2% range. And knowing with our expenditures, at around 112 to 113 million dollars, one percent can be 1.1 million dollars. So if you're at a two percent variance, that's where you can get up into those two million dollar ranges. For the 24-25 budget development, we are going to continue to look at our enrollment. We are tracking that daily. Um, we just had our very first staffing meetings today, where we're talking about sections where we believe they're going to lie. So we will continue to track that. We have to always look at our state and federal funding, and we do have to acknowledge the expiration of those federal funds with ESSER 3 and 11T. Of course, we're a human capital-driven organization, so the levels of our staffing directly impact our personnel costs and all the things that are related to that, the retirement rates, our medical rates, and our predictions there. And as just talked about with the past couple slides, of course, our capital improvement needs as well, too. And of course, we meet with all of our departments and schools. Um, we are about halfway done with those meetings to this point. We have about 16, 17 more meetings to go, and we will put all of those numbers together to bring you an initial projection on June the 3rd. So in summation, this is a positive budget adjustment for the board. Um, we will continue to refine these numbers and make sure that what we're bringing to you in June is our closest projection, again, with a touch of conservatism to it, to make sure that we continue to be um, in the positive when it comes to our review and our audits. With that, I'm happy to address any questions before we ask you to take action on this first budget adjustment for this year. So Brian and, and Penny, we originally had budgeted a deficit budget of almost five million bucks and I think at the time if I remember the conversation correctly we had said you know the reason for that was we had built up a fund balance we had some ESSER dollars and we knew that we wanted to continue some of those programs um, to support students and get growth and achievement out of our students the way that we we saw fit um, so we wanted to responsibly spend down that fund balance. Now we've, we're, we're looking like we're going to be slightly positive again. Are there, are there any interventions or a, additional programming that we, we may want to think about this summer? Or how do we continue to climb the ladder for our students with growth and achievement? given the positive budget outcome that we're looking at. I'll start and you all can chime in. Uh, so first to address your summer question, we are right now planning our summer school program and we're fortunate that we still have enough uh, grant funds available. Kind of a combination of grant funds, we're using some Title I uh, for our two uh, schools that qualify for Title. Uh, we're using our 23G funds and some 31A. Have grant funds available for summer school. Uh, 
uh, and we feel good about that. And then moving into the future, we'll certainly earmark money about a 31A for that. Um, we are in the process, and I'm looking at Jen and Melissa, because we've been talking a lot about our multi-tiered system of support. You've learned a lot about our tier one instruction and how we're focused there. That's our next endeavor, is to really look at what interventions we need for tier two supports. We have some in play already, and we need a little bit more analysis before we just jump in to purchasing anything. Mm -hmm. We, um, without <coughs> maybe revealing and uh, all the details yet, we are near the end of that program evaluation process that we talked about for our grant funded activities and uh, in our budget planning process have made some initial decisions about what we know we can sustain and continue in part because we're in good shape financially and there are still some other little grants that we're going to really access fully and I don't know Brian I'm I just feel like they keep popping up there's a, a new Title IV special grant that we can access. Uh, so his comment about those categoricals is real. Uh, we're gonna keep leveraging every dollar we can. Mm -hmm. Like we have, a, I wish Kim Funnel were here because I always say to her, we're not gonna leave money on the table. If there's a grant that we qualify for, we're gonna go after it, but it comes with a whole loop of work. Mm -hmm. And we wanna be careful not to um, overextend ourselves by mm -hmm. purchasing a lot of tools, resources uh, that have legacy costs to them. Yeah. So I guess just to put a finer point on that, yes, there may be opportunity, but we want to be really intentional about it from an instructional perspective and a financial perspective. What would you layer into that, Brian? I think that you did a phenomenal job in explaining that, Penny. And I do believe that Penny's going to ask someone to present to you soon the <laughs> sustainment plan. Okay, yep, um, but we have put a lot of hard work into addressing the question of what's going to happen when the ESSER funds go away and what can we sustain. We think that you as a board will be very proud of your grant team and the way that we have um, utilized the different categoricals to be able to provide sustainment for a couple of years. Um, again, I don't want to spoil that entire presentation because we are still in that process, but we've done a three-year forecast beyond this year to be able to take a look at what has worked based on program evaluations, what we can sustain, and we also believe that the strategic use of these funds can also enhance the areas that we believe have shown to have the highest impact on academic growth. I think I just gave half that presentation, Penny. Um, <laughs> but um, I know that we'll be bringing that to you soon, and um, it is something that I think is a very, very, it's something that you as a board should be proud of when you see it. Um, again, each and every single pot of money that has arisen, we've gone after it. Um, and there are some folks in the state that haven't, but we have not left any cent um, unapplied for, if that's the right <laughs> mm -hmm. grammatical term. Um, we, we've continued to grab those, and every time that we do that, we've had to shift funds from A to B, which is an incredible lift for your business services team and grant team to shift the account codes the way that we're doing it and the paperwork that goes around behind it. So I think that um, as a school district, we are well positioned to not have a fiscal cliff impact us the way that you're seeing in some of the um, sl other school districts mm -hmm. um, that are grappling with some higher fiscal issues with this. We are forecasting that we'll be able to sustain and enhance um, some of these initiatives because of the strategic way that we've used our fund balance. But I do want to caution um, everyone and all of these when these numbers come. Um, yes, we are in a good position, but the reason that we're in that good position is because we've had the ability to move our planned initiatives from pot to pot. As those pots have popped up, we've been able to grab them, push things into it, meaning that we could do other things, and there will be a large sum of money, I could tell you just now based on initials, of things that we were sustaining using grant funds that will have to go back into the general fund based off of the categorical nature of some where they just don't fit. We know that they're important, we know that they work, so they will have to go to the general fund. So there will be a large burden coming back onto the general fund. There's no need to panic. You can see that we're in great fiscal shape and we do have the ability to be able to react and inject strategically where we need to and perhaps spend down some of this fund balance as well too. I will say one more time too, if you didn't catch me when I said um, this does not include fund modifications, um, we will be moving money again to our capital improvement funds. This does not show that. Traditionally, we do that a bit later on. Um, we will 
annually spend in the neighborhood of around 1.5-ish to $2 million. We have a large physical plant here in the Midland Public Schools and labor supplies and material. If you've done home projects, you know, they're mm -hmm. just not getting cheaper. Um, and so we continue to have those needs while we continue to explore the future of our facilities plans. Um, we need to make sure that we are, of course, taking care of our physical plant needs annually as well, too. So, yes, it's positive. Yes, the board has been great stewards of money. I do believe you're going to be very pleased when you see our sustainability plan as well, too. Um, but we still do need to be cautious of building in very large sums of money that is embedded into the budget because that could lead to negative outcomes. You just have to be strategic in how you're doing it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions for Brian? Along those same lines, um, we'll get more information moving forward, but like I said, we had CIA earlier today and there was uh, lots of reinvestment of those dollars back into the district for collaboration and curriculum and um, lines up with exactly what you're saying. And, and those dollars are higher than they ever have been. Mm -hmm. And there are many multi-tiered or multi-yeared requests that are coming forward, um, utilizing those dollars as a reinvestment. Um, Gen Service, Kimberly Funnel, Tracy Speaker, Kirstheimer, and Velocity were all presenting different things to us and their ideas of what's come from teachers from ground up as well as administration um, improvements to all of that so you'll be hearing more of that in the future great thanks Brad all right take a motion to approve um, the 23-24 budget amendment number one item 6.6 .6. so moved well I don't know who that was <laughs> Who wants that one? Give Jen. Jen? Is there support? Support. Motion by Ringgold, support by Lauterbach. Any further discussion? All in favor of approval of the budget amendment number one, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Item 6.7 for information, gifts totaling $12,500. $506.61. Brian? Thanks, Phil. Um, for information only, as you pointed out, we are grateful to acknowledge 13 gifts this evening, totaling $12,506.61. As you can see in your board packet, they represent a wide range of items from support for athletics, robotics, and field trips. Per tradition, all of the donors will be recognized in the credits of this evening's broadcast and also through board correspondence. We appreciate their generosity. Item number seven is human resources. Um, I believe there were no, there was no meeting since the last no. time. So no. we'll move right into item 7.1 for information. Mr. Jaster. Thank you, Phil. Um, tonight, we only have uh, two staff to recognize as compared to the previous month when we see our biggest list um, of retirees announced. But first, from the MCEA group, uh, teachers group, and these are effective May 31st, 2024. Uh, Paula Hopkins is retired from, announced her retirement from Dow High School as a te teacher there. And then also from our transportation department, um, Beth Farling has announced that she will also leave effective May 31st, 2024. Thanks, Jeff. Item eight, correspondence to and from the Board of Education, number 8.1, for information, letters from the Board of Education to the following individuals and groups as listed in the agenda packet. Item nine are scheduled activities for information, the board meetings uh, as scheduled listed out in the agenda packet. I also note that we have a special meeting on Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Then item number 10, study session discussion. Um, are there any points of clarification that any board members want to raise? I just want to add um, another thank you in regards to um, the process with HYA and the superintendent search to our administrative staff. Um, there's been a lot of tours and extra communications and um, technology stuff and scheduling that has been taken on by, by this whole group over here. So thank you to all of you for your extra work in that process. Yes, good point. 
Um, I just have one thing to, we've talked about it a lot at our board meetings, but there's um, information for the public on the renewal of our operating millage. Um, by my calculations, the operating millage affects each household in Midland, the average household being about $5 per month. So please, please reach out. Um, Penny has listed her email and phone number on here if you have additional questions as well. So reach out if you have any questions. Just as a quick point of clarification, the um, amount you just offered is specific um, to the hold harmless millage on, as you said, yep. on residential properties on primary residence, yes. Thank you, Penny. Um, and then Penny, any Yeah, other? I just have a couple, and I'll, since it's, um, it's late, I'll, I'll just pick a few of the celebrations I have. Um, first, I'll just uh, let the board know, if you didn't have a chance to see the communique today, uh, that this weekend we're hosting the first of Great Lakes Bay Region a robotics uh, competition. It's the ninth annual competition and it will be at Dow High. It will be a spectacular display of all great things. Uh, really fun if you've never been to a robotics competition. So stop by Friday or Saturday, even if you can just stop in for a few minutes. It's just fun to sense the vibe and the camaraderie uh, that those teams have. We have a really special uh, celebration. We have Odyssey of the Mind. It's a new endeavor for some of our students over at Central Park Elementary. And this weekend with state competition, I'm looking at Jen in case I get any of my facts incorrect. And we had a team qualify for nationals, which is oh, so wow. exciting in our first year doing this. It's a team of five students of mixed grades, so they're not even all together in one grade. And we're excited to support them as they move on to competition. If you're not familiar with Odyssey of the Mind, it's a kind of a problem-based endeavor and students get a problem ahead of time and this team has to develop really unique solutions. They go to competition and present those in a really interesting, almost um, theatrical way. They get sort of credit for being extra creative and then when they're there, they get a unique problem that they haven't seen before to solve in real time. It's uh, just a really awesome skill building activity and they get to connect with other students from around the state. Uh, speaking of being awesome, you know, we had DECA this weekend, and as usual, fabulous job, 122 Dow High students attended the state competition, and 14 of them qualified for internationals, which is in Anaheim, California. Uh, earlier this month, our Midland BPA, also spectacular showing, had 41 students attend, 23 of them qualified for international competition in May, which is in Chicago, and many of those students actually qualified in multiple events. Um, we might have one Brutin that did the same, maybe <laughs> two. Uh, if you missed the, this weekend, the Dow High Spring Musical was maybe one of the best student performances I've ever seen. The talent uh, is just out of this world. It was Alice at Heart, it was a uh, spin on uh, Alice in Wonderland. The cast, the crew, the ensemble, the direction, it was, it was really a remarkable, um, a remarkable event. And lots of other great music things happening. It's tis the season, and we know that when our band students and our choir students go to competition, they are exemplary, really proud of the work that our students are doing and our teachers in those areas. And you know, we're headed into spring break. So just want to take a minute to wish all of you and uh, all of our school community a very restful, safe spring break week. And we'll come back rejuvenated, ready to make it to the end of the year. Great. Thanks, Benny. <clears throat> take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Stand adjourned. Thanks.